that we're working. Today's principal topic is wintering waterfowl, and that could be expanded to wintering water birds. And, uh, and you think this talk is just about ducks. I know that, and you were thinking, do I want to drive all the way in just for ducks? But anyway, 100 years ago, just about every bird I'm going to talk about today was not here. Wow. Was absolutely not here. Things wow. changed. Uh, we entered the 1930s when we became very conservation minded. Uh, prior uh, to 1930s, the uh, passenger pigeon had gone extinct, the Carolina parakeet had gone extinct, and the heath hen had gone extinct. So all of a sudden, by the 1930s, we got very conservation-minded as a country to, should we do something? Uh, and this is where we're at today. I don't know if you've all got a list, but this is my kind of unofficial list of Knox County, because I've worked at I'm so many years in Knox County. If you don't have one, I brought it copies today. But these are the birds that can be seen here at different times of the year, Knox County. There's, I think, 171 species on it here. Now, if you live in Anderson, Loudoun, uh, Rome, it's probably identical. But if you live over Sevier County, Blount County, anything that takes in parts of the mountains, you're going to have you're going to have more species. If you live in uh, uh, Sevier County or Blount County, you're going to have a raven at the top of the mountain. So anyway, uh, but as far as the valley goes, this I think is pretty close, but it is my list. It's unofficial. I could have left something out, but make sure you have one. Uh, it's, it's just handy to have. Now, year round, we got duck, duck, goose. The only two ducks that are here year round are the mallards. We all know mallards. We learned mallards when we were five years old. Uh, they're very, they're very out there. But the wood duck is here, but very shy. They tend to be if you live near the lake and near a cove, they like a cove or a stream moving into the cove. At Imes, there was a stream on the eastern edge of the property called Toll Creek, and they would occasionally nest on that stream. But that's the only two that are here year round. Geese, yes, we have Canada geese year round, but that's not always been the case. It isn't. Geese, we had pretty much eaten these guys out of the area. They were a large food, and uh, we pretty much were gone. I don't know if you can read that, but they were by the 1800s. Uh, come on in. By the 1800s, they were pretty much expatriated here. We'd eaten them all. Same is true with turkeys. We ate them all. Well, we didn't have Kroger's every year. You know, Dad had the best he could do then. Anyway, it was, an, uh, it was a private citizen in Sumner County that started raising Canada geese to release uh, from his farm. And he started raising them on his farm, but then releasing the young ones, releasing the young ones. And it started working. And so uh, TWRA took over that program in 1966 and with the help of TVA. And so now we have Canada geese. <laughs> we have Canada geese. But every time you see one, and if it's pooped on the greenway, you say, okay. We didn't even have a greenway when you were totally gone. So anyway, <laughs> geese, uh, they eat grass. They're, they're the cows of the bird world. They eat a lot of grass, eat a lot of grass. And cows have two that magical two stomach thing. Geese can't do that, so when they squeeze out all the nourishment they can quickly, they, they go, it flies through them. So that's how they exist. Oh, and we do have this little ugly duckling, uh, the muscovy, year round. But this is a this has got a, such an odd story. Uh, the la I saw a bunch of them at in Lenore City a lot, uh, along the lake about two years ago. Uh, Anyway, this is the native Muscovy duck that could was native to South America and Central America. And when uh, the explorers started coming over and discovering new things in the new world, uh, the Muscovy would wow and started taking Muscovies back to Europe uh, to domesticate and to domesticate. And same is true of our very wild turkeys. Anyway, they think the name came from the Muscovy 
makes sense. It must have been a trading company that came over and loaded their ships up by these ducks and took them back and now uh, and domesticated them. And then they brought them back, and so that's why we have so many of them. So it's got a weird story of, of its history. And they had this uh, kind of similar to uh, uh, turkey vultures, they had this area of flesh, and they think that's more or less for. Uh, uh, to show off for the males to attract females. Uh, on there, there's no feathers there, so they think it's more of a, hey, I, look how good looking I am kind of thing. <laughs> now, winter waterfowl. Uh, here's, again, back to our little history lesson. Uh, if you're, a, uh, uh, if you're a, a member of TOS, Tennessee State Ornithological Society, you get the migrant, which is published four times a year. And uh, this is the migrant, and I've got a whole stack of them. Uh, I wasn't around in 1939, but I've got this one. Anyway, uh, and every year they publish the findings of the CBC. And the CBC is the Audubon Christmas Bird Count. Happens every year across the, well, across the country uh, to count birds in and around Christmas, uh, originally it was done on Christmas Day, and uh, there was a, that's a long story. I write about it in my first book, but I'll truncate. But uh, it's slow, it's spread like grassroots to go out and count birds in a given area, and then turn your findings into the Audubon Society. And uh, I've circled this one particular edition because it publishes uh, the CBC data for 1938. And where I circle is principally our area, no waterfowl. That bird count didn't find it. And, but Norris Dam was created in 1936, so this is where TVA comes into play. As TVA built dams, this raging river became a series of still water lakes. So not only was it a welcome home to migrating waterfowl, but it was also a welcome home to bald eagles, osprey, uh, great blue heron. But in this particular year, and it was the bird count held in 1938, two years after Norris Down, they found one great blue heron. Now they're everywhere, and zero waterfowl. So this is when the, the sea change began to happen with our valley being changed from raging river flood and all the time to still water lakes. Oh, our first one I love to talk about. American coot. That's just such a fun thing. <laughs> American coot, they do not look at your toesies. Well, that's not an official word. Anyway, uh, they do not have web feet, but they have little flanges on each toe, which makes it like a web foot. So it's little flanges, and they're incredibly common. I don't know if they're back yet. That's the one reason why I want to schedule this for November. So if you live near a lake, or you drive by a lake, or a pond, uh, you may be, oh my gosh, what is that out there? And typically, coots are in flocks. They're called commotion of coots, and they like to hang out together. So, uh, and there's a lot of ponds around that's not connected to the, to a dam like Springbuck Park in Alcoa has tons of really great birds there. Or even Dead Horse Lake has a great pond on it, which I find good birds on it And uh, uh, as we get into winter. I don't know if many of these or any of these are back yet or entering that period. Oh, grebe, grebe, grebe. I just love to say the word grebe. Pied bill grebe, it's a tiny little bird. Kind of looks like a duck, but it's not a duck. Uh, and it's a loner. You may see a whole uh, commotion of coots and one grebe with them. Do, 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 do. So it's, um, and it's called pied bill because it's got spots on its bill. So, but it's a smallish kind of waterfowl. And this poor thing, well I shouldn't say poor thing, it is an excellent swimmer uh, and diver. Uh, the hunters used to call them devil divers because about the time they would put a bead on them of a gun, and you could never predict where they would pop up. They swim and swim and swim, and all of a sudden, they pop right back up. And look how they're such great swimmers. Their legs are so far back on their fuselage 
they can't walk well on dry land. They fall over. So they tend to spend all of their lives on water and they'll nest on uh, some kind of a flotation of vegetation. And if you're watching them, and you'll go, where'd he go, where'd he go? And you, it'll pop up, you can't even predict. Uh, every now and then you'll read a story about a, a grebe landing on a, and there's several species in the country, landing on like a wet uh, asphalt parking lot. And from the air it looks like a pond. And they can't get up. <laughs> they can't get up to fly. They're flopping around because, again, their legs are built so their legs are built for swimming and diving. People will come over, grab them, and just throw them up in the air, and they take off. So if you ever see what appears to be a wounded grebe on a parking lot, it just needs to get airborne. That's all you have to do to help it. Okay. Now that as the ducks go, we've got two principal groups, and this will. If you're looking at a duck from a distance, and ducks let you have a good look, but it's usually from a great distance, so you may need to have a pair of binoculars with you, uh, there's one easy way to determine the two groups. The <coughs> dabbling ducks, you see their keisters pointing up there. The, a mallard is a dabbling duck. It just flips over, and whatever it can grab uh, at that depth of water, that is what it's eating. So that's one of the dabblers, and a mallard is a dabbler. Uh, green winged teal uh, uh, is another dabbler. It, it's got a, a cinnamon colored head and that green mask, but I'll get to it in a minute. But this is the time you're also that male and female ducks start pair bonding. They start pair bonding. You look out, and you'll see one male kind of dominating a female, not letting any other guys look at her. So that starts happening now too, but uh, green winged teal actually get their name if you see them fly. Where the, that's where the name comes from. Is their secondary feathers along the back edge do are greenish, still have the green kind of mass, and that's not always easy to tell because we have this one. It's not very common. It doesn't show up that often. It's bigger, but it's also got a green head. But it's American widgeon, uh, and it gets its. Uh, it's also known as bald pate because, like the bald eagle, it's got a white top on the top of its head is white, as the green winged teal does not. So that's how what you look for there. It's bigger than the teal, but uh, it's got the white area on the top. And remember, every now and then you're going to see it flip over with its the keister stuck up in the air. Oh, uh, air. Oh, gad ball, gad ball, gad ball, gad ball. This is a very common one. It's so darn hard to identify sometimes because it looks like a female lot. It looks like a female mallard. It looks like all kinds of things. And I can't, I don't even remember how many times I've been staring at one of these going, what in the, oh my God, it's a gadball. You have, to, for gadballs, you look at the, you look at its back end and it's black. And you go, oh, it's got a black behind end. It's a gadball. But they're very, very common and they're out there. So that's gadball, very common. Who's next? Ah, uh, northern pintail, uh, much less common. This is the only, I think, the only duck on the list that's declining in population, and it's declining. And I've read a couple articles are working to help. Uh, it's declining because it doesn't nest on the shoreline; it goes inland a bit to flat area and a lot of the inland bits are being turned into soybean. Now, they don't nest here. They, they only spend winters here. But up north where they nest, they go inland a bit, and a lot of those inland areas are be turn, turning into fields, soybean fields or something like that. So um, that's one of the areas that, that, uh, uh, that U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Duck Unlimited are raising money to buy some of that area and turn it into pintail because they're gorgeous birds. Uh, but if you do happen to see one, obviously the tail, uh, the, this uh, long tail, very sharp pointed, uh, is where the name comes from. And I like to point out that that same kind of marking is on the side of the head as well. It's got a cinnamon head, but that same white stripe kind of mimics the tail. So that's uh, Northern Pintail. Here's a pair hanging out. And as I said, this time of year, Mel and Pina, he's starting to dominate her, and she's going, okay, okay. Anyway, you just don't do it for me, so I'm gonna fly over to the other side of the pond. I'm sorry. Remember, remember, female choice, female choice. <laughs> she has the ultimate say. 
So that's northern Pindel. Now here we're going to bring in a whole other thing, concept of how we are making things right. This is the duck stamp for 1923 of a northern Pintel, and the artist was Chuck Black. Now what a duck stamp is, if you are a duck hunter, and I, not a hunter, I could never possibly be a hunter, but my dad was a hunter, although he wasn't a duck hunter. But anyway, so I understand that, uh, I understand. Uh, because uh, when it comes to ducks, duck hunters do the basic senses. If they're not seeing as many species, I mean, if they're not seeing as many gad balls, they're gonna say, hey, wait a minute, guys. Uh, we're not seeing as many gad balls as we used to. We just need to slow her down. And if you're a duck hunter, you have to have a state license, and that's uh, about $160 for a state license. But you also have to buy the current duck stamp, and it's 25 bucks. That's This is the federal uh, license. So not only do you pay the state license, but you pay the federal license, which happens to be a nice, pretty duck stamp. And so that's the duck stamp for 1923. And of course, if uh, a TWRA officer is walking around, he wants to see your permits. He wants to, but he wants to see your permits. And there is bag limits. It's like fishing and different species. Oh no, no, you can't. You know, only one such and such uh, are you allowed. So they really do keep close sense of what the duck world populations are. This is the very, very, this is when this all started. Again, the 1930s was this kind of sea change of conservation efforts. We're losing animals, shouldn't we do something? And so this is the very first duck stamp from 1934 to 35. So if you were a duck hunter, this is the first time they did it. Okay, you had to have a duck stamp to show an officer if you were out duck hunting. They sold 635,000 of them at a dollar a piece. And that money was used to buy land. That money was used to protect ducks. That money was used shorelines. In fact, uh, we're gonna meet the hooping crane in a bit. The very first national uh, wildlife refuge was Aransas, Texas. It was bought in 1937, and it was bought to protect wintering whooping cranes. We'll get there in a minute. So that's what's happening out there with the uh, uh, with the funds for the uh, for for hunting. They're buying property. They're doing whatever they can to protect to protect. Now we're into the other guys. We uh, and I had to sh uh, shorten. I had to shorten the talk. And now we're into the other guys, uh, what's called the diving ducks. They don't turn their keister up, they disappear. So they dive, they dive, they're good swimmers. The redhead is one of the bigger ones, and I think there's a bit of concern about this one, but it'll, we had one, at, when I was at Ines, we had a redhead, uh, redhead duck that spent the whole winter at Meets Quarry Lake and just had a great time out there. So that's a redhead, obviously where the name comes from, very simple. And here's the duck stamp that honors a redhead. That's from 1922. And again, that would have been $25 that went somewhere to help uh, uh, ducks and water birds. Uh, the canvas back, it's the largest of the diving ducks. And um, it was almost gone in the 1800s. It's so large, we really ate a lot of them. But again, it's making a comeback. I don't recall if I have ever seen one on what's called a life list. If you really, really get into this, next thing you know, you're keeping a life list. And every time you see a brand new bird, you write it down where you saw it, its number where you saw it, just to remember, and that's your life list. And in our area, like, the, like my list showed you earlier, uh, if you stayed in Knox County, your life list would go up to around 175, maybe 200. Now, if you get gun ho about it, not that people obsessed on birds can get gun ho about it, <laughs> then you start planning vacations. Honey, why don't we go to Myrtle Beach? I think we can pick up maybe 15 new birds out there. <laughs> okay, I'm good with Myrtle Beach. And then I know there's a, I know a couple in town. Uh, they plan their vacations just for birds. You know, if we go to New Zealand and spend a week, goodness. And so 
to tap out, to top out your bird list, life list 10,000 species on the planet, roughly. But, and I know, I know people say, okay, I'm gonna have a big year. 2025 is gonna be a big year. Uh, I'm gonna start day one and see if I can have the biggest year ever. And that's called having a big year. And I had a good friend that had a big year in just Tennessee. I don't remember what he ended up with. But that's the other way birders just kind of play with, them, <laughs> play with their brains. Anyway, let's move on. I digress. Uh, here's the duck stamp uh, for the campus back, uh, 2014. But again, sold $25 each. And there are people that collect duck stamps, uh, just like U.S. postage stamps. Uh, the ring neck duck, fairly common. This one I used to always find on the uh, pond in downtown Maryville. Uh, but they're around. Uh, it's called a ring neck, and you can't quite see, but that white does go all the way around its neck. I really use, I would have called it a ring bill, maybe, but there's a gull named that, so never mind. So ring neck duck, very, very common in our area. Buffalo head. I think it's just adorable. They're small ducks, and normally you may not see the spot because that's kind of like a crest. And if he wants to show off or look intimidating, you'll flip that head up, and all of a sudden, a big white spot. And the name comes from, my God, he looks, he's got a head as big as a buffalo. It's stuck. I don't know who first said that. I can't find that anywhere in the history books, but that's where it came from. Then we got a common golden eye. Uh, I know, James Bond movie. Anyway, uh, I, I'm i not even sure I've seen one of these. I'd have to go back and look at my list. But it does have a gold eye. But that white spot under the gold eye is really more, to me, the identifying characteristic because it's seeable from a great distance. But very uh, not as common. Uh, Lesser Scott, uh, or it used to be called, or it is called, a little blue bill. It's a smallish duck. There was one that hung out uh, off North Shore, as I recall, two or three uh, years ago, and everybody went out to get their lesser scop. So that's uh, a smallish bird. And here is the duck stamp, uh, 2020, that again, $25 went to conservation efforts. Diving ducks with stiff tails. The only one, locally. And it, it, it's, like a, it's like a wren. <laughs> You know that all your wrens just walk around so cocky. They got their tail sucked straight up. Anyway, it's a runny duck. <laughs> I know. It's like they're so. Uh, I don't recall seeing one in our area. It seemed like it was a little more towards the middle of the state. I would pick them up, but that's a little tiny runny duck. And here's the duck stamp for it. I probably overdid these duck stamps, but I think they're really cool. 2015. Now we have the mergansers. Basically, a merganser is a duck with teeth. They have kind of a sawbill, because they dive for fish, and that helps them catch the fish. But they have, we had a specimen at nine. Uh, people would rub their finger along the bill. It's kind of a sawbill. It's not teeth at all, but it's like, it's like a really easy to catch a fish. Hooded merganser. Very, I love this bird. It's it's fairly decently common. Cove Lake is another. If you live in that part of the state or that part of the area, drive up 75 to Cove Lake. They have lots of wintery ducks up there. Anyway, and this one seems to be always there. Uh, hooded merganser, a duck with teeth. But again, that white crest is when it lifts its crest. Otherwise, you don't notice that whole white area. But when it's uh, feeling, feeling good about itself, it'll flip that up. So Cove Lake, I know, is an excellent place to go for this. And just go sit at the picnic table, take a lunch, and just watch the ducks. Wow. This one's got a story. <laughs> I used to rarely, in fact, I can only remember seeing one common merganser, and that was Seven Island State Birding Park. Probably, that was pre-pandemic. Uh, I've been out where I did a book talk for ghost birds in Washington State, and they're very common out there. But here, I used to say they're not common here at all. But 
a Instagrammer, photographer, bird lover, musician with his wife named Keith Watson, who lives in Pittman Center uh, and has an Instagram page full of his bird photos, and he travels a lot too. He documented Hoosier Ganser's race in three or four clutch, clutches on the North Prong and the Little Pigeon River last June. And he would find, at first, he was like, what? <laughs> but he kept taking photos, and so they, it may be an indicator that there are moving more in, a bird's move. They're at the Y, too. They're at the Y? Okay, yeah. bingo. They're nesting on Little River, Talico River, Seneca Creek. They're all over the place now. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And then, I know you know the creeks. Anyway, uh, thank you. This is, I'm not 100% sure. But I'm reasonably sure this is just the animal spreading their range. They're doing well, so they're moving east, moving east. Like our beautiful, beautiful barred owl is doing so well, it's moving west and west and west, and now it's, uh, now it's uh, being looked at as maybe a little too far west. I don't want to get into that. That's a gross story. Anyway, cranes. I did include, uh, we used to have cranes. We still have now. Samuel cranes were virtually gone from the east by the late 1800s. Again, we shot them and ate them, we shot them and ate them, they're a big bird. Uh, now the population is believed to be about 98,000 and roughly 75,000 do fly over Tennessee or winter in Tennessee. Hiawassee is a place to go to see cranes, 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 Samuel cranes, Samuel cranes. But I recall read JB out of H.P. Imes was who Imes Nature Center was down and named in honor of. He was a big time bird person and he started the local KTOS and also chapter of uh, the uh, TOS. Anyway, I recall reading an article, he was very excited in the migrant and all of a sudden they found Sandhill Cranes in Seymour. So they have slowly started to come back. Now they're back in huge numbers. I had, this is a Sandhill Crane with a young one. But if um, I don't, Pat, do you know, are they back in Hiawassee yet? Typically it's November, okay. Typically it's November, but cranes come flying. You can be out in your backyard and look up and see cranes flying over. And they're unmistakable, it's like, wow. And they do, uh, they stay in mass at Hiawassee Wildlife Refuge down Mix County, Ray County, north of Chattanooga. Uh, make yourself a note to go down. January, February is typically the height of Sandhill Cranes being down there. And you'll see a photograph like that, they're just everywhere. They're out in the cornfields, they're all over the place. So that, and here's a bird that was gone, absolute gone. And now they're back in good numbers. Whooping Crane, oh, what a story here. When I wrote my second book, which is really principally about the Ironville Woodpecker, but side, the side story is about wildlife conservation change in the 1930s. That's when, they, that's when if this was a group of wildlife officials and we were moaning the fact that we, birds are going extinct, somebody would say, well, shouldn't we do something? <laughs> yes. And so all of a sudden, conservation-minded people started trying to figure out what to do to save. Back then, in the 1930s, the five species that were listed at, we, we didn't, they didn't use endangered species, they used vanishing species would have been whooping crane, ivory bill woodpecker, trumpeter swan, rosette spoonbill, California condor. Of those five species that they were so concerned about in the 1930s, only the ivory bill is <laughs> no one knows yet. Uh, but the other four have been saved somewhat, not completely, with uh, whooping cranes. They were pretty much, and I write this whole story in the third book, uh, they were pretty much gone, whooping cranes, historically had three flocks. Had a flock that flew due south from Canada to Aransas, Texas. They were saved when we, um, they were helped to be saved when we <coughs> created Aransas uh, National Wildlife Refuge. There was, a migrant, there was a flock that did not migrate that principally was in Louisiana. They stayed put. And then there was an eastern flock that flew over us from the Great Lakes area all the way to Florida. That flock we wiped out. We shot, the, I think it's in my book, but I think we shot the last one of those for whooping cranes, 1901 in St. Augustine, Florida. So we completely wiped out the eastern flock. 
A hurricane took out the middle flock, the non-migratory flock, and so all that was left was a dwindling western flock, and that's why Aransas became so important. They were down to roughly 21, 21 total whooping cranes in the world in the 1940s. Now that population is up above 800, uh, so we're working on building it back, building it back. From what I've read, if we can get it to 1,000, they're gonna go, 1,000 is kind of a magic number, although there's a lot of people, a lot of uh, biologists concerned to start with a gene pool that's only 21 living specimens. Wow, can we build it back to be a viable, pop, viable sustainable population on its own? So that's whooping crane, America's tallest bird, yes. So are they all in Texas now? Or they're scattered a bit now. There's, there is a, we're gonna get there. Oh, okay. Uh, there are some at zoos, or some in protected areas, uh, and there's a couple of, they're working on a couple of the, uh, I'll get there in a second. Okay. Anyway, this was uh, kind of the first U.S. postage stamp Conservation, yes, three cents. Remember, you can mail a letter for three cents. I, I don't remember, that. oh, 1957. In 1957, you'd just go out there mailing all your letters, three cents a guy, you're going, three cents, that seems like so much. Anyway, that was the first conservation stamp. Uh, there's a place uh, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, called the uh, International Crane Foundation. I visited it there in 2006. And they have various crane populations from around, various cranes from around the world are trying to help, trying to build back numbers, trying to have this created by a man named George Archibald. So I visited in 2006. These, the two adult cranes can't be released or non-releasable, they have injury, but they raised a viable young one that can be wild. So here's the, how we got the Eastern population back. It's still kind of frail. But a man named Bill Lishman, uh, that's his photo, got permission to teach whooping cranes how to migrate. Uh, and he started a nonprofit called Operation Migration. And I met Bill, I knew Bill, and I actually helped with this a little as a volunteer. It's so funny that how many birds know where to migrate? They don't need mom or dad. They just say, okay, I'm going to Costa Rica and see. Whooping cranes, America's tallest bird, has to be taught where to migrate. They need them, they need the visual map of how to do it. So Bill Lishman got first, he proved he could do it with Canada geese. He raised a flock of Canada geese. He's from Canada, he is Canadian, and uh, flew uh, flew them, uh, uh, flew them, migrated them, left them alone, and the, and the flock came back on its own. So they seemed to be taught one way. That became a movie. I've drawn a blank on the name, so anyway, uh, it, he was known as Father Goose, and there was a movie about that portion of the story. But then he got permission with U.S. Fish and Wildlife to do it with uh, hooking cranes. If this works with Canada geese, and so in 1921, he started flying hooping cranes, and he taught them how to follow one of those ultralights, and the cranes followed, like, okay, Dad, we'll go and... And once they got to Florida, the ultralights disappeared and the hooping cranes flew back. They knew they'd only had to be taught one direction. Knows how many birds they do it on their own. Anyway, so from 19, uh, 2001, 2015, uh, he helped reestablish the Eastern Migratory Flock of Hooping Crane. We are really good, people are just darn good. Uh, it's the first time that I recollect, that I read that Human beings taught an animal a lost behavior. They didn't know where Florida was. We taught them where to find Florida and they do it on their own. That population is still kind of smallish, but occasionally some of those cranes do turn up at Hiawassee. You'll be standing there looking and there's uh, hundreds of sandhill cranes and two or three whooping cranes with them. So uh, make yourself a note if you need a field trip, January, February. Uh, I think it's roughly 90 miles from Knoxville, but that's, anyway, Operation Migration has stopped their work because it's established, will it keep going? Will it keep going? That's, it's, it's all very tentative. 
And during the time that I was a volunteer during the time, when the cranes, were, when the living cranes were brought in to Hiawassee, they spent the night in a corral that was part on land and part in water, and then once they were in there, the whole thing was covered with canvas, so they were so protected. But one of the first, uh, when they were there initially, uh, a first couple of years, one of the cranes picked up some, cranes are always probing mud for food, and one poor crane got uh, a, a can caught on his bill, and when he was flying the next lap, a rat, lap the guy flying the ultra route looked over, and oh my God, and when they landed, he just popped it off. So I was part of a volunteer crew to the day or two before they got there to go in and rake the mud. Uh, the only person that's not in the photo that I, Vicki Henderson was there too. So uh, anyway, uh, I took the photo, but we would have to go down before and rake all the crap out of the mud. Beer cans, beer tongs, <coughs> everything you can think of, just so it was clean mud for the cranes to spend the night there. They might, they usually were there just one night, but if the weather wasn't right, they may stay in there quite a while. Um, and I'm gonna finish with this way in advance. Remember I was talking about that lifeless thing? <laughs> I was there, I went to Hiawassee on December 26, 2011, saw dozens of sandhill cranes, saw a few Whooping cranes, that's the only two species of crane in America. But there was this poor lost Asian hooded crane with them. So I get to put that down as a, there were three cranes at Hiawassee that day, one poor lost Asian. And birds get lost sometimes, they have wings, but they sometimes get lost and turn up in odd places. So uh, I will always remember that day uh, that I actually saw three crane species at one time. Okay? I think we're done.